Jeremiah 29, 11, in the New King James, God says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God has thoughts about you. Even when you feel alone and isolated, God is closer than you could possibly imagine, as near you by spirit as your very next breath. And in every moment, as you are awake and alive and moving about, or even in the moments when you are slumbering and sleeping, he has thoughts that he thinks about you. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Digital Examine podcast. I'm Jay, and what a journey it's been. First, thank you so much for all of you who joined us for this first season of a brand new podcast. I know that's always a risk. Your time is valuable, and I know it always feels like there isn't enough of it. So just the fact that you would come along with us, my heart is truly, I really mean this, just overwhelmed with gratitude. And I don't take it for granted that you gave us the gift of your listening ears and your attention. And if you have been listening for the duration of this season, you know that attention is a gift that I don't take lightly. I am so grateful that you lent us some of it over the course of these many episodes. I know that for me, it's been such a gift to be in conversation with so many men and women who are thinking deeply and more importantly, living deeply this life of examining it all before the Lord and with the Lord. There have been so many highlights for me. You know, I think about what Dr. Felicia Wu Song said about the gift of self-forgetfulness, Sarah Cowan Johnson, and just her incredibly helpful, pragmatic advice for navigating a life with God for our children in the midst of all of the challenges we face in the digital age. I remember John Ortberg, he had this line that has just continued to reverberate for me in my life, that God is not so much interested in our spiritual lives, God is just interested in our lives. I think about Rich Velotis and the incredibly poignant words he shared about sin being really at its essence a failure to love, which then helps us make so much sense of the fact that it was love itself, sacrificial love, Jesus on the cross, giving it all for us that defeated sin, which is a failure to love. I think about Tim Mackey and uh, what he shared about paradise now everywhere, that it is accessible, the presence of God everywhere all the time, and so many other conversations we've had this season that have been so helpful for me. As we conclude this season together, I thought I would share just a few thoughts, maybe one big sort of final thought to leave you with. And the thought is about thoughts. It's about thinking. It's about reflecting constantly and consistently with our whole beings by focusing our thoughts on the presence of God at all times. A number of years ago, I went on a night hike, my first ever night hike, you know, with the uh, the headlamp attached to the forehead. It was this beautiful hike that's not far from where I live called Mission Peak in a city called Fremont, about 20, 30 minutes north of where I live. And it's about the hike, Mission Peak. It's about three miles and you climb about 2,100 feet. It takes a couple of hours to reach the peak, particularly in the evening when it's hard to see. And so some friends and I, we had our flashlights and our headlamps and the entire hike, I am just so focused. I am concentrating on every single step because it is dark and it's climbing 2,100 feet. I mean, if I misstep, I'm falling off the edge to death. And so I remember, even in the midst of conversation as we were hiking, I was just so intensely focused on the next step before me. And, you know, our minds, human minds, um, are designed to focus our attention on the most pertinent and immediate details in front of us. And often this is because of, you know, potential danger, uh, wanting to stay safe or wanting to excel or achieve or whatever it might be. This is in fact the mind's sort of default approach. What is the most important thing in front of me? And how do I focus all of my mental energy on that thing? 
And focused attention on the details really matters a great deal, right? That's it, what keeps us safe and alert and effective in some of the work that we do. But it also has its limitations. There's a writer, a scientific philosopher named Michael Polianyi, and he once wrote that unbridled lucidity or hyper-focused attention on one particular thing can actually destroy our understanding of complex matters. When we are hiking through a forest, paying close attention to what's immediately in front of us, it really matters a great deal. It keeps us from running into trees. But the point of hiking through a forest is the entirety of the experience. And so there is a way in which we can, on hikes and in life, pay so much attention to the trees, but that we miss the forest for the trees. When I think about relationships, particularly the ones that are really most meaningful, they're like complex forests. There's twists and turns and surprises along the way. And we have to learn to absolutely see the trees along the journey, but we have to do so without missing the forest. We've got to learn how to live in constant awareness of the entire relational connection everywhere, all the time. This is what this podcast has really been about, opening our minds to the possibility that God is accessible, that he is present at all times if we would live examined lives, hearts, minds open to the possibility of the divine in our midst, even in the most ordinary and mundane of situations. And so as we conclude, I want to invite us to consider the possibility of not just thinking about God on occasion or spending time with him every now and then when we're not too busy thinking about other things, but the possibility of thinking with God everywhere, all the time. This is really important because our thoughts really determine the orientation and the direction of our lives. This is why the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 12, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Or in Ephesians 4, when Paul writes, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. And so, according to scripture, we can experience transformation and renewal through our thoughts, through our minds. How does this work? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, same writer, Paul, he says that the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. And the person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But and here's the key phrase from Paul. We, you and I, followers of Jesus, we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. In other words, it is possible to not only think about Jesus, but to think with Jesus. To not only fix your minds on God, but to align your mind, your thoughts, with God. In recent years, neuroscientists have discovered what they call brain synchrony, and they've tracked this neurologically through brain scans. And it happens all the time, like when students are really engaged with a teacher in a classroom, the brain waves within the brains of the teacher and the students, they begin to align. They look the same on the measurements. When you go to a live concert, brain processing can align between the performer and the audience. Or when close friends are sharing a cup of coffee and having intense, deep, meaningful conversation about the important stuff of life, they have tracked and measured this and the brain waves begin to align far more than just distant acquaintances having a quick conversation in the hallway. One writer in the Scientific American, Lydia Denworth, she says this, that when people converse or share an experience, their brain waves synchronize neurons in corresponding locations of, of different brains. They begin to fire at the same time, creating a matching pattern like dancers moving together. I love that phrase that our thoughts can dance with the thoughts of God. Our minds can align with the mind of Christ because we have the mind of Christ. We can think not just about God, but we can think with God. But this requires conversing with God and sharing experiences with God consistently. 
This is why we've offered you early on in the season and throughout, if you go to IVP's website for the Digital Examined podcast, a quick little tutorial sheet about what the prayer of examine is. These five movements of invitation, gratitude, reflection, confession, and looking forward. If you've not grabbed that yet, just go to the website and um, you can print it out or have it on your phone. And we hope and pray it's a, it's a helpful tool for you as you practice the examine every single day. In Philippians, Paul writes, brothers and sisters, whatever is true and noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. This is how we are formed into Christ's likeness. We think about the stuff of God. And we think about those things with God, in one mind, with Christ. This is the path to being formed into Christ likeness. Again, Paul in Colossians 3, he says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. In Christ, who is your life. In Paul's words, it's not just that our lives are hidden with Christ. It is that Christ himself now has become our life. The writer Jim Wilder, in his book Renovated, he says that there is a large difference between thinking about God being with us and thinking with God about our reality. When we think back about what God wanted in a past moment, we can feel remorse. But thinking with God changes our initial reactions. It changes our character. Again, this is formation. Not to think about God from time to time, but to think with God about all of our reality in every situation you face with God. God, you are with me here and now. What do you think about this? Tell me to think about it the way you think about it. His presence available at all times. Not long ago, I was on a flight home and I was sitting next to an older woman and maybe about halfway through the flight midway, she pulls out her iPad. My iPad was already out. I think I was reading a book and this older woman pulls out her iPad and I thought she was going to do what I was doing or what so many people on the plane were doing with their iPads. I thought she would read a book or maybe watch a movie or a TV show, but instead she opens her iPad. You know, it's a small cramped plane. She's sitting right next to me. I can't miss it. She pulls out her iPad and she opens the photos app on her iPad. And she begins with this big beaming grin on her face, just in her own world. She begins scrolling and swiping through a series of photographs of herself and a young mother and father, and then these two young children. And these two young children looked to be about my children's ages. And so at a certain point, I just leaned over to her quietly and I asked, hey, is that your family? And she says, yes, this is my, my daughter and my son-in-law, and these are my grandbabies, she says. And so I began asking her about her grandchildren, and she tells me their names and their interests and how much fun she has with them and the joy that they are in her life. And eventually, as we continue talking, it I come to realize, she tells me, that she is on this plane on her way to see her family, to see her daughter and her son-in-law and her grandchildren. I thought it was so striking, so interesting that she was looking at photographs of these two little grandchildren that she was on her way to see. There was something in her that even though the physical distance still existed, that as she is on her way to bridge that physical gap, these little kids were already on her mind. And I just thought that was so moving. And it, and it made me sort of long even more to land that plane, get home and to be with my own children, even though they were on their way to see one another, to be with one another. This woman could not wait because her grandchildren were already on her mind. They're always on her mind. There's that famous verse in Jeremiah chapter 29, where God says, Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Now, that's the NIV version. And I rarely read, I certainly almost never cite 
the new King James. It's just not my translation of choice, but I do think the new King James version of that verse is so profoundly powerful. Jeremiah 29, 11 in the new King James, it says, God says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God has thoughts about you. Even when he feels distant, even when you feel alone and isolated, God is closer than you could possibly imagine, as near you by spirit as your very next breath. And in every moment, as you are awake and alive and moving about, or even in the moments when you are slumbering and sleeping, he has thoughts that he thinks about you. And the invitation of the examined life is to live with our thoughts fixed on him. Not just to think about him, but to think with him at all times and all things in all of life. That is my hope and my prayer for you as we leave you and conclude this season of the Digital Examine podcast, that you might think with God in all things in all of life at all times. And you might experience richly and deeply and transformatively his powerful, loving, gracious, kind presence. Thank you so much again for joining us. It has been uh, such a gift to be able to share these conversations with you. And I hope to talk to all of you and hear from you at some point very soon. Grace, peace, and love to you. Mm -hmm.